I'm Paul Cantonzero from down at UMass. I'm going to be talking about forest carbon. I'm largely going to be um, taking this uh, talk from a, a recent publication that I co-authored with my colleague Tony D'Amato uh, from here at UVM. Um, and so I want to acknowledge Tony. I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, my, our colleagues uh, over at the Northeast Climate Science uh, Center, as well as NIACS, who uh, have provided some technical assistance on this work, as well as uh, funding from the Renewable Resources uh, Extension Act, REA, which uh, gave us the, the funding to, to actually uh, print these uh, outreach publications. So forest carbon, 17 minutes. You ready? Everybody's in? All right, let's try to do this. All right, so one term. Can you hear me? I'm Italian, so I move a lot. Uh, so one thing that we want to address with this publication uh, are these two terms that we, we hear people confusing a lot or even using interchangeably carbon storage and carbon sequestration. So the first thing I want to do in the slides is just sort of clarify these two. Carbon storage being the carbon that's actually stored in the various pools within a forest. Hold that thought, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Carbon sequestration being the process of plants, in our particular you know, specific interest, trees, pulling carbon dioxide out of the uh, atmosphere, using that as raw material for photosynthesis. Two related but different terms, this becomes really important because when we talk about benefits of forests and carbon, these actually peak at different times in forest development. So pulling these apart and using these appropriately becomes important. We'll talk more about that. So where are these carbon pools? Carbon exists in a number of different places within the forest. The most obvious being the live above ground, but we also have pools live below ground, dead wood, cavities and snags, um, leaf litter, the twigs, the leaves, the branches, um, as well as soil organic matter. So uh, forests have carbon within them, within different pools, and importantly, these pools can change over time. So we can gain carbon in some of these pools, and we can actually lose carbon in some of these pools, and the decisions we make as land landowners and land managers influences that, and that's a part of what I'm gonna talk about today. Wanted to give you a sense of the proportion of carbon within each of these pools. T taking a look at just some, uh, some very common, typical uh, forest types within Massachusetts and New England. Uh, so if you took it, uh, you know, oak pine, northern hardwood, oak hickory, spruce fir, um, you could take a look at the proportion. The proportions are a little bit different based on the climates within those areas, but an important trend I want you to note is two of the biggest pools in all of those forest types are the soil pool and the above ground, the live above ground pool. So when we start later in the presentation talking about strategies, I'm sort of really gonna key in on those two pools. But recognize the pools are dynamic, they change, and forest types change you know, uh, pool to pool as well, okay? This is it, this is a big slide. This is like forest ecology boiled down into one diet. So this is the forest succession development clock we developed. Uh, if you take a look at the years, the years are roughly the years since the forest was initiated, okay? And forests change over time. That should not be a surprise to any of you as foresters and resource managers. But with that change more precisely in, in stand composition and stand structure comes changes in benefit. Right, so the, the wildlife species we see at year five are not the same suite of species we might see at year 50, nor are they the same suite we see at year 200 within a forest, right? Benefit changes, likewise, carbon benefit changes. It's not the same at all points within forest development. So we've developed this, uh, simple, I hope, relatively simple diagram. So the yellow band represents species composition. So at the time of forest initiation, um, we have our shade tolerant species, and they're, you know, they've evolved over time, they're most competitive there. As the forest ages by year 50, 60, uh, the shade mid tolerance, right? We've got that stand reinitiation coming in, uh, or understory reinitiation coming in, and then by the time it's around 100, which is you know, roughly what our, our forests are now, shade tolerant species are more common. So we see changes in species composition over time. Uh, that pairs well with that green band, which is carbon sequestration, which is, remember, the process of removing carbon dioxide out of the air. So we see, see the sapling to pole move very quickly, then we get this really intense amount of competition within the stand. Now, importantly, sidebar, this isn't individual tree dynamics. We're talking about standard per acre per stand level dynamics. So I'm talking stand dynamics, 
not individual trees. And that's something I see a lot of people, particularly in, in the press and so forth, sort of, sort of uh, dock chains. So we're talking uh, stand level dynamics. When we get into this stem exclusion phase, you know, in year, say, 20 to 50 particularly, we see uh, leaf area uh, maximized and we see high rates of carbon sequestration uh, out there, like teenagers who are drinking milk. Uh, they need lots of energy. Um, you know, we see that same thing within forests. Um, shortly after that, say you're 60, 70, it's not that sequestration stops, it's just that it slows down. So we see a peak uh, around that, that uh, those years, say 20 to 60, 70, uh, and then it just uh, it, it declines a bit, but then maintains. Carbon storage, remember how much carbon is stored in the forest, actually just continues to increase. So we see um, trees getting larger we see uh, more litter on the ground, that increases that pool. We see more trees die, that increases that pool. We see the litter and the dead trees decompose, that increases the soil pool. So over time, we see you know, the increase over time of those pools. Importantly, you'll also note though, from years zero to say 10 in our region, um, we're actually a uh, source of carbon until so our forests reinitiate and sort of can catch up and be a sink again. Okay, so that's important, and we can move those hands, right? Disturbance moves those hands backwards, right? And that's what the dotted line shows. So disturbances can, can knock a stand back. It can actually move succession forward, and we, as managers, can actually do those, those same things through silvicultural interventions. So um, our decisions actually, um, uh, two major decisions that impact forest carbon are the future of the land, as well as what kind of management we're doing. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is the future of the land. And I know this is not why um, you came today necessarily because uh, you want to talk about silvicultural strategies, but I can't resist making sure we're all on the same page that keeping forests is forest is the first and foremost thing we need to do in terms of maintaining these benefits. When we remove forest cover, we're decreasing all of those pools, uh, stumping, grading, depending on what the change of land use is, you know, we're removing all of that forest carbon. So I know there are lots of contentious conversations about do I do a passive approach, do I an active approach, you know, what's the in between, but I hope we can all get on the same page that square one is stabilizing the forest base and all of these benefits because when we do lose that it's often permanent, or for the very least, uh, it's decades. So right, we build a house, it's there for decades, if not more. When we do a, a contract for solar panels, it's usually decades, maybe more. So these are really important losses of carbon, and oh yeah, by the way, it's water quality, it's wildlife, it's timber, it's all of those things, okay? So for those of you that work with private landowners, are private landowners, if you wanna make an impact on climate change and forest carbon, conservation-based estate planning, and there's some wonderful resources in all of your states that can help with that. The second decision I wanted to talk about is the, is the forest management one, which I know you're probably most interested in, and there are two approaches generally we can take. So this first passive approach is to let nat nature take its course, right? That means no timber harvesting, not removing anything. That doesn't mean it has to be completely uh, it can be non-extractive, right, not taking timber out, but we still may want to uh, enter the forest, uh, increased resiliency of the forest by addressing needs such as invasive species, so it doesn't have to be completely passive. Um, this will likely maximize carbon storage. So please remember our, our clock diagram, the longer it goes, the more those carbon pools are filling up. Um, so we're likely maximizing carbon storage through this approach um, and also continuing sequestration. If you were interested in this, you'd probably want to cite this in, on sites that are mesic, that are very rich, that are protected, right? We want to reduce the amount of disturbance because we want those stores to stay there and, 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 um, and, and maintain their storage capacity preferably embedded within some unfragmented landscapes. You really want to put those carbon, you know, tons of carbon in a bank and, and let them just sit there and get them out of the atmosphere. There are some important trade-offs, and I should have said this earlier, there are trade-offs to both of these approaches. So I'm going to cover both of the amount of uh, trade-offs. The first is forest resiliency. We all know our shared land use history in the Northeast. Um, a lot of our forests are of similar age. Uh, similar structure, we know disturbances typically affect particular parts of a forest. So if we have all of our eggs in the one basket in terms of similar species composition, similar structures, then we might be setting ourselves up for a large 
carbon loss through some disturbance, as opposed to being able to do some interventions that accept some small carbon losses in exchange for making a more resilient forest. So I think depending on your landscape position, depending on the structure of your forest, if it's simplified, depending on the kind of species in your forest, you've got lots of ash, got lots of hemlock, then I think there are some important considerations uh, for active management uh, in terms of the trade-off. Um, John Scanlon just did a great talk on you know, looking at species in decline. I think we as a society have to have that conversation, or you as a landowner or a land manager, you know, is carbon and climate change worth the potential of losing native species? For some people, I've had landowners say, yes, you know, they'll have to fend for themselves, and, and I think my job is to you know, store as much carbon as possible. That's a trade-off, right? That's a trade-off. Um, wood products, uh, I, I, we didn't go into this in the publication because it's, it's very complicated and it felt like once I got off the landing beyond there, there'd be dragons. But um, just, just, I think it's important to note if we're not using our local wood, where are we getting it from? What else are we using? And what are the carbon implications of that? And I think that's something uh, as foresters, you know, generally we all sort of subscribe to. But these are some important trade-offs in terms of the passive approach. How am I doing on time? Thank you. So, um, of course, the other approach would be to take an active approach towards forest management. Um, when you take a look at the literature, there are, of course, uh, a couple of pools that are most affected logically alive above ground, right? And the amount it's affected is dependent on the amount of, of trees that are harvested. The litter pool is also affected in the range of, given the literature, 20 to about 36% reductions, largely to Due to increased decomposition, mechanical crushing of the, of the limbs, and so forth. And the good news is BMPs have been found to be effective, when implemented correctly, at uh, eliminating the, the loss from the soil, or certainly mitigating that. So I think that's very good news, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm going to sort of focus on those, the, that top one. So there are some carbon, what we would call carbon-informed forest management strategies. I'm going to show a couple slides that look at those. Um, they're, they're outlined in greater detail in the publication, so uh, I would encourage you, if you're interested, to take a look at that. The first one, and everyone was like, oh, you're working on that. You know, what, what are some of the recommendations? And I said, good BMPs, and people were really disappointed because I know that's really boring, but remember, remember that it's good old-fashioned advice. Remember that those carbon pools, soil is so critical. Um, you know, good contracts. Um, right machinery, timing, season, I mean, you know all of that, good supervision, it makes a huge difference. So let's break these down not only to, um, to the pool, but also sort of within the pool we can affect stain structure. Large trees have a disproportionate influence of the carbon within the stand, right? So these dominant, co-dominant trees really are storing a tremendous amount of carbon um, within those. We can extend the harvest cycles, right? We can take a look at increasing over 15 or 20 years, or to translate that maybe a little differently, maybe extend the diameters out an inch or two before you're actually regenerating those. Um, we can use regeneration methods that actually retain some of these mature trees on site. Okay, so we're actually keeping those carbon stores on there, and we can actually uh, leave, you know, leave trees on the site. Um, we would have called those legacy trees. Now more people are calling them retention trees. We can leave carbon on the site, right? We can choose to do that and let them just grow old and have a wonderful habitat and so forth. We can create multiple age classes. Um, remember, larger trees are storing more. Those young vibrant trees are competing and they're actually sequestering more, so we can balance that. So we can affect stand structure um, and, 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 and affect carbon. So um, we can keep high levels of stocking, right? The more trees on there, the better, but also being, in, uh, being mindful of the vigor of those trees. So we can use our stocking guides a little differently. Instead of looking at you know, full site utilization, we can sort of look at vigor uh, and make sure our trees are vigorous enough for things like potentially uh, drought and so forth. Um, we can look at species composition, so from a resiliency perspective, encouraging species that um, are predicted to do well. Um, we want to maintain trees that are um, perfect. 
uh, that can be those dominant codominants where we're seeing jumps in carbon that continue to grow up per acre is we get these dominant red oaks and these white pines, these super canopy trees that are emerging from the canopy and continuing to grow. And so we want to encourage those kinds of species. And if you really want to get down to sort of the, the nitty gritty species level, we could also encourage trees with, with greater wood density. There is a downside to this, right? So the trade-off, like passive has trade-offs, active has trade-offs. We're reducing the site's total capacity, potential capacity, for, um, for storing carbon. So we remove logs, we're removing you know, uh, carbon from the site. That's a trade-off, right? So we have to be honest about that. Uh, I will say that most of our conversations about carbon uh, focus on stand level considerations. We've been trained that way, we apply science in that way, so it's no wonder we do that. But let's also take a step back at the landscape. When you look at the FIA data, we're doing pretty darn good. So you can choose either New England or the state you are from, and you can see that we're actually growing more carbon than, than we are uh, harvesting. So, so that's good news. And these are results from the past, right? With more, the, with greater implementation of carbon-informed strategies, these numbers could actually improve. Not that they're bad, but you know, being mindful of carbon as we move forward could actually improve that at the landscape or regional level. Um, I want to be clear, this is one of the points we really want to make is, it doesn't have to be one or the other, right? We don't have to choose passive or active. There are multiple scales. So if you're an organization, a land trust, or a landowner that has multiple properties, you can do reserves and, and passive on some and active on another. If you own one property, you can choose one stand and make it passive and manage the other ones. Within a stand, you can do retention trees and manage the other trees, right? So at multiple scales, this doesn't have to be one or the other. We actually need this both, we need both strategies across the landscape. So taking a look at good old fashioned evaluating each individual parcel, its landscape context can help you decide. So I would encourage you, like let's, let's not take our eye off the ball, all right? Let's make sure forests are forests and that's our highest hit. Um, look at those big carbon pools that we've got out there and implement ways to, to, um, to maintain them, and then I would just suggest just being conscious and honest about what those trade-offs are moving forward to meet landowner goals. <laughs> um, the other thing I would say uh, is just, I, the publication is up here. Uh, I've got some, if you want it, great. Um, please come take one. I've got boxes of it, so if you want one, I'd be, and they're not here, I'd be happy to mail it, or if you want some to mail out to your, your constituents, uh, they're there and they're free. It, it, we will store it for limited amounts of times, could be decades. Um, we look at the Pisgah sites of Harvard Forest, you know, some of those huge white pine are still up, you know, they're above ground and they're still, you know, relatively solid and so forth. So it's temporary, but it's decades. And we'll see, likely see our largest increases in carbon storage within our forests in diameter growth in dead wood over time in soil. So those, are our, those will be where the big jumps will be over time. Y yes, I'm no good at the. Yes, sir. You touched on it just briefly, but I think uh, focusing on what happens to the wood that you're taking out, I mean, if the wood's going to a chip mill or a pellet mill where it's going to be burned, you know, right back into the air. So prioritizing, if you're taking wood out, using it for a wood product that's going to be around, and we have a limited amount of time. To deal with this issue, and it would be far better if we weren't burning. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, I, I, there are trade offs to those. I think, in general, I would say growing high quality wood products matches well with carbon. 